Um, all right. Um, before, before calling Senator Abetz, um, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Australian Political Exchange Council third delegation from the Republic of Korea. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Evans, the minister representing the Prime Minister. I refer to the Leader of the Government in the Senate's address to the Refugee Council of Australia on 17 November 2008, when he was the Immigration Minister, in which he said, and I quote, Labor committed to abolishing the Pacific solution, and this was one of the first things the Rudd Labor Government did on taking office. It was also one of my greatest pleasures in politics. Given the Prime Minister's statement yesterday, why did the government demonise Nauru for four years, and does the government now acknowledge that its decision to close the Nauru detention centre was a mistake? Order. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Betts for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, uh, uh, I don't know whether those are exactly accurate marks, but I suspect they are. Uh, and uh, I did have great pleasure in abolishing the Pacific Solution, uh, and I continue to uh, 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 have the view that the approach taken with the Pacific Solution, as with putting uh, uh, terrible conditions on people through TBVs, as with make, making people pay for their detention were punitive and wrong. And I think that's the wrong approach. And having a, had a chance to look at the uh, Houston report uh, today as I was travelling yesterday, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I. Uh, Senator Cormann, do you want to have a go? Order. Order. And I'm happy to point the finger at you Order. again, Senator Cormann. Order. Happy to point the finger at you uh, Senator, again. Senator Cormann, Senator Evans, order. Order. Interjections are disorderly. Senator Evans, continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, as I was saying, it was a regime based on punishment and trying to convince people that if you hurt them, if you hurt them, they would stop coming. Mr. President, having read, having read the Houston report, it, it recommends a very different approach, Mr. President. A very different approach. Well, I had the pleasure. I had the pleasure of talking to uh, Senator, House Senator House Evans. You just might, Senator House Evans, today, you just uh, might resume your seat. It might be easier, much easier. Order, 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 order. The minister, continue. Um, uh, Mr. President, I had the advantage of talking to uh, Mr. Paris Aristotle, a member of the Houston Review, this morning, and he uh, pointed to, uh, out to me the very, very strong differences in approach in terms of using uh, Nauru and Manus Island uh, for, uh, for uh, detaining of uh, people uh, seeking asylum, Mr. President. And, uh, and I suppose I just make this point: the Pacific solution was was premised on a, on a belief that you should tell people they couldn't possibly resettle in Australia and leave them to rot as a, as a signal. That's not the approach being recommended here. And it's not the approach in the legislation. Time has expired. Time has expired. Order. Senator Betts. Given the government has now adopted one element of the Pacific solution, namely reopening Nauru and Manus Island, Will it now also adopt the other elements of the Pacific Solution that proved so successful in stopping the boats, reintroducing temporary protection visas and turning around the boats when it is safe and possible to do so? Order. Order. Sen Senator Evans. Mr President, the government has sought to implement the recommendations of the Houston Review. And despite attempts by the opposition, despite attempts by the opposition to misinterpret, misinterpret what has been said, 
I have read the report, I suspect unlike many opposite, and that's not what the report says at all, Mr President. The, government's, uh, the government has uh, not been able to get its preferred option through the parliament. We have therefore uh, had the Houston Review make a set of recommendations to us. I must say I'm, I'm impressed by the work they did because I think the central, the central uh, message in their response is to look at a no advantage, a no advantage principle. And I think that's a very interesting way of trying to bring together the various, uh, various balances one has to draw in these matters by focusing on a no advantage principle, that there is no advantage in seeking to come by boat, but that you will get fair treatment and you will get an opportunity to apply for asylum. Senator Betts. Just to clarify, is it the government's position that it will not turn around a boat even if it is safe and possible to do so? And if so, why? Order. 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 The Minister. Mr President, uh, the uh, Senator continues to misrepresent uh, what the report says. And I, I, uh, I, will, I, will, uh, I will look to uh, find the actual quote. Order. Order. Senator Roberts. My uh, supplementary question did not refer to the report at all. What I'm seeking is the government's position. Order. There's no point of order at this stage. The minister has 49 seconds remaining. The minister. Well, Mr. President, the obvious point to Senator Betts is to say that we've adopted the recommendations of the Houston report. It will form the basis of legislation being introduced in this parliament, I think, later today. The senator and all senators will get a chance to debate that legislation if it's passed by the uh, House of Representatives. But, Mr. President, it makes clear that it is not possible to turn boats around when the conditions are such as they are. And the clear one, the clear one is Indonesia have made it clear they will not accept the turnaround of boats. The Indonesian government will not accept it. That is a very, very clear problem, Senator. And the, uh, the report refers to other issues which make it unsafe and impossible in the current circumstances. I suggest you read the report. Senator Moore. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Disability Form, Senator Evans. Can the Minister update the Senate on the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Moore for her long-term uh, interest in this, uh, in this issue. Mr President, the Gillard government is absolutely committed to delivering a National Disability Insurance Scheme. And NDIS will make sure we're delivering the kind of care and support Australians expect for people with a disability, their families and carers. One year ago, we received and released the Productivity Commission's report into disability care and support in Australia. This showed that people with disability, their families and carers were waiting far too long for the care and support they need. That's why this Labor government put people with a disability, their carers and families first when we committed to an NDIS. The NDIS will end the cruel lottery that sees people with disability receive different support depending on where they live or how they acquire their disability, give decision-making uh, uh, to people with disability, their families and carers, putting choice in their hands so they can make most, the most of their opportunities and fulfil their potential. It's why we're getting on with the job of delivering the foundations of the, uh, the uh, scheme, Mr President. We put $1 billion on the table to fund the first stages of the scheme. We have established a new launch transition agency to run the delivery of care and support people with disability, their families and carers, and applications are open for the $10 million practical design fund. I can also inform the Senate that in the past fortnight the government has reached agreement with the governments of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and the ACT for launch sites. Mr President, we regard this as a fundamental labour reform, standing up for ordinary Australians. Mr President, like another great reform, labour reform, Medicare, a national disability insurance scheme will provide comfort to every parent in the country. It will provide an answer to the very, very uh, neglected needs that people with disability have had to suffer for many years. Senator Moore. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how the announcement of the launch site in Victoria will benefit people in the Barwon region? 
Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Look, the government is very pleased that, with the Victorian government, we have agreed to a launch site in Victoria, in the Bowen region. From July uh, this year, about 5,000 Victorians with significant and profound disabilities, their families and carers will have their needs assessed and will start to receive individual care and support packages under the NDIS. This is an additional investment of more than $190 million by the Commonwealth in the Geelong region, direct investment in providing better care and support for people with disability, their families and carers. This means people with a disability in the Bowen region will be assessed to receive NDIS individualised care and support packages, have decision-making power about their care and support, including choice of service provider, be assisted by local coordinators to help manage and deliver their support, and access a system that they can easily navigate and that will link them to community services. It's a very welcome agreement and we look forward to the trial being rolled out. Time's expired. Senator Moore. Thank you. And can the minister also advise the Senate on how the government is working with the community on the development of the NDIS? The minister. Uh, Mr President, in developing the NDIS, the government is committed to engaging with people with disability, their carers and families, and the community more broadly. Uh, to involve those Australians most closely involved with disability, the government is funding the National Disability and Carer Alliance to hold a series of form forums across the country. It means that people from all walks of life can help shape the detailed design of the scheme. We have also launched, launched an online forum, NDIS Your Say, which asks for people's views on key questions about how the scheme should work. Also, the government has established an advisory group to work closely with all governments to lay the foundations for a national NDIS. Four expert, group, expert groups have been appointed, and uh, the key elements of scheme design, choice and control, eligibility assessment, quality and safeguards, and workforce and sector capacity will be a focus of their work. This will ensure a stronger and more effective NDIS Time for the has future. Expired. Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister uh, representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Uh, Minister, uh, how much revenue from the minerals resource rent tax has the government collected in July this year? The uh, Minister Order, the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Cormann for the question. I don't know how I've managed for the last six weeks without questions from Senator Cormann, but I struggle through, Mr. President. I struggle through. Um, uh, 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 in terms of the MRRT, uh, uh, as you know, Mr. President, uh, I previously advised Senator Cormann. Uh, that the uh, forward estimate projections for the MRRT revenue are $13.4 billion. That was a, a revision down from the previous— uh, order, uh, order, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, po point of order, and it goes to the requirement for the minister to be directly relevant to the question. I asked the minister a very specific question, which was how much revenue the government has collected uh, in MRRT revenue in the month of July. There is only one answer to that question that can be directly relevant, and that is a dollar figure in relation to the revenue collected in the month of July. There's if the no, minister doesn't know the answer, she should just say no, so. There is no point of order. I believe the minister is answering the question. The minister has a minute and 30 seconds remaining. The minister. As I was going on to say, Mr President, in the last budget we updated uh, and revise the uh, MRRT revenue to $13.4 billion over the forward estimates. Uh, as Senator Cormann well knows from questions in this place and in Senate estimates, uh, the government acknowledges uh, that uh, the, uh, the rev revenue take from the MRRT obviously depends on a range of factors such as commodity prices, exchange rate and production, and production volumes. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and by, by, by virtue of being a profit-based tax, is obviously more volatile than other other forms, uh, other types of revenue. Uh, in terms of the the, the, the quantum, uh, the the senator knows that uh, I release monthly statements uh, uh, of uh, uh, the budget. Uh, and those are released uh, uh, every month uh, from, from the preceding month, and I'm sure he, he, can consider, he can consider those when they are made public and when they are released, as is usually the case. Uh, I would make this point about the position that Senator Cormann asserts. Senator Cormann has— Order. 
Order, Senator Brandis. Question of direct relevance. The minister has just told us that she is not going to provide the figure which is the subject of the question. She's now turning to make a comment on the question of the what she calls the position Senator Cormann asserts. Senator Cormann asserts no position. He merely makes an inquiry which the minister has told us that she is not able to respond to today. Nothing more can be relevant directly or indirectly. Order. There's no point of order. The minister is answering the question, and the minister does have 25 seconds. I'm listening closely. Order. I'm listening closely to the minister's answer. The minister has got 25 seconds rem remaining to answer the question. The Mr. President, well, we got to Supi Lala pretty quickly, didn't we? Because as soon as they, as soon as anybody uh, starts talking about them, minister, come to the question. Minister, come to the question. Order, minister. Court, come to the question. You can't have it both ways. You can't say the mining tax doesn't collect any revenue but will also simultaneously kill the mining industry. And that is the hypocrisy Order. of the other side. Order. That is debating the issue. Order. The minister has. Order. Minister, I draw your attention to the question. You've got seven seconds remaining. The minister. Minister? <laughs> have you finished? Thank you, Mr. Minister. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, why is the government not in a position to provide the information I sought in relation to MRRT revenue collected by the government in the month of July when the Prime Minister made a solemn promise to the then leader of the Greens, Bob Brown, when refusing to release information about MRRT revenue assumptions and estimates like commodity price production volume and other assumptions? She made a promise less than five months ago to publish monthly updates on revenue collections from the MRRT. Why are you not in a position to do so today? All right. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, Senator, through you, Mr. President, uh, I will say this to Senator Cormann about the, uh, uh, the figures, and I will go back and check this because I don't have a, a comprehensive brief on the July position. Uh, my recollection, and, and it is only a recollection, is that uh, uh, we, we were anticipating quarterly instalments on the MRRT. If that is the case, you wouldn't anticipate uh, the first set of instalments to be paid until October. But as I said, Senator Cormann, I will check that uh, because I don't have a, a comprehensive brief on this issue. Uh, but I would remind you again that uh, uh, we update our budget figures uh, at each budget update and the mid-year review. Uh, and that is more than can be said for any costing that you have ever been involved in. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to table a copy uh, of the Prime Minister's letter to uh, uh, then Senator Brown on the 18th of March 2012, where she made the promise uh, that she would publish monthly updates on revenue collections from the MRRT. Senator Evan. Mr. President, I'm just having a look at the letter that the uh, manager has, but uh, I'm happy to take that motion at the end of question time, just, to, uh, just so we can have a look at the letter first. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, final supplementary question. Uh, if the government can't even stick to a promise the Prime Minister made to her alliance partner, the Greens, how can anyone else in Australia trust any of the Prime Minister's promises? Order. The Minister. Uh, I th well, Mr. President, uh, coming from a man uh, who knows he has to find at least $70 billion worth of cuts, at least $70 billion worth of cuts uh, to services that Australians need, and we can see, we can see in the Victorian Liberal government and in the Newman government in Queensland precisely the approach that Senator Cormann will want to take. You know, cutting frontline services, cutting jobs. Uh, cutting education, just what Liberals always do when they're confronted with a budget black hole, and that's what they have. So, Mr. President, Mr. President, we know for all of the chest beating by those on the other side, that economic team has never come up with a costing that added up, not once. Not once. They go to catering companies and, and accounting firms who are found to have acted unprofessionally. Not once have their costings added up. And the consequence is they'll have to do far worse than what Premier Bailey and Premier Newman are already inflicting on their populations. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy, Senator Evans. 
And I ask, does the government agree with the Coalition Energy spokesperson, Mr Ian McFarlane, uh, but not its leader, Mr Abbott, uh, that some state governments have been profiting from gold-plating electricity distribution systems, unnecessarily driving up electricity bills for ordinary Australians? If so, if so given COAG's slow and poor performance and conflict of interest on electricity market reform to date, what confidence can the community have that anything other than talk will be done about it. Minister representing the Minister for Energy, Senator Evans. Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Mill for her question. I think uh, uh, I'd respond by saying I think there's a great deal of community concern about the uh, increases in household electricity prices that we've seen over the last three years. I understand uh, that uh, many have risen by more than 40 per cent, and that's obviously concerning to uh, people faced with those costs, particularly those on fixed incomes, pensioners and other low-income earners. As President of my own state of Western Australia, this has been a huge debate, and uh, I think people are very concerned by those rising electricity prices. I, uh, I think the Prime Minister uh, on the 7th of August sought to bring attention to some of the issues that uh, exist in the industry and concern that perhaps uh, uh, the issues such as potential overinvestment in network infrastructure uh, or uh, the, uh, the, the pricing around electricity uh, by state governments may, see consumers, uh, may have seen consumers paying more than they needed to. In terms of the carbon price, the federal government made sure that the uh, household assistance was uh, more than adequate to cover any, any uh, increases driven by the carbon price. But the ongoing increases in electricity prices uh, are, are concerning. I think the Prime Minister, in asking states to uh, bring, uh, bring um, uh, possible uh, remedies to the next COAG meeting, is trying to address uh, seriously what is a major concern for families and households in Australia. And uh, while the implication in the Senate's question was rather negative, I think that's, uh, that's not a bad starting point to try and focus on what we can do better to try and keep uh, electricity prices down while maintaining a sustainable system. And hopefully COAG will make a step Time in that direction. Expired. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, given the Prime Minister's concern about uh, higher than necessary electricity bills because of the incentive to sell more electricity instead of helping energy efficiency, when can the community expect the implementation of a national energy savings initiative which the government committed to investigate as part of the Clean Energy Future Agreement? When can we expect that? The Minister. Um, Mr President, um, I think the Senator is right to point to uh, the need to uh, target energy savings approaches as part of uh, dealing with the, these issues. It's part of why uh, uh, we've implemented a carbon price as part of our uh, uh, encouragement of alternative energy sources. And, uh, and I think uh, people accept that uh, uh, household, uh, household usage patterns of usage and behaviour are an important part of energy saving. Uh, my own partner is training us all to turn off the, uh, the power source, something I've not got very good at yet, but it's part of that practical response uh, uh, to the problem. In terms of the specifics of the National Energy Saving Initiative, I don't have a brief on that with me, uh, Mr President, but I'm happy to take that on notice for Senator Mill and get her an answer as soon as I can as to uh, the status and progress on the National Energy Savings Initiative. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. And finally, why did Minister Ferguson uh, claim that the NEM objective is universally supported when the evidence is to the contrary? And can he tell me which of the ongoing inquiries address the question of whether the national electricity objective should be amended to incorporate sustainability and climate change? So what's the evidence for the statement and when is it, which review actually addresses the objectives of the NEM? The, the Minister. Um, well, I'm sure uh, Minister Ferguson uh, acted uh, for exactly the right motives and driven by uh, sound public policy 
I haven't actually been briefed as to why he particularly. No, it doesn't hurt me at all. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, why uh, the remarks in relation to the NEM were, uh, were made, and uh, nor the particular review focus that the senator is seeking. But as with the second, uh, sorry, the first supplementary, I'll try and get the uh, the uh, senator a uh, answer on notice that deals with those uh, those issues. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. I refer the minister to the same speech as Senator Milne referred him to, the one to the Energy Policy Institute of Australia given by the Prime Minister last week. And I ask the minister, when did the Prime Minister first become aware of the mounting pressures being faced by so many Australian households and businesses as a result of increasing electricity prices? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Order. 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 The Minister. Mr. President, um, can I say to um, to uh, the good Senator, um, I think. Uh, the Prime Minister has been aware for some time, as we all have, about the growing community concern about the increasing uh, cost of electricity in Australia. And, uh, and, uh, it has been a, 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 con a concern uh, that has been raised with this government for, uh, for some time and has been part of the community debate. Uh, the Senator would be aware, though, that the state uh, governments uh, are responsible for electricity prices in this country. And, well, well, Senator, if that's wrong, I, I, I stand to be corrected. But last time I checked, last time I checked, the state governments were responsible for the setting and control of the electricity systems in their states. But, Mr. President, the cost, the, the carbon price will have an impact on electricity prices. Senator, something that we have uh, that we have uh, 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 made clear for a very long time. It's also the case, Mr. President, that the family assistance package shaped by this government that's been paid to families across Australia was designed to assist them in meeting some of those costs. And it's been quite clear from all the regulatory uh, assessments that have been done that the increased cost uh, as a result of the carbon price will be more than compensated for by the, by the family assistance packages. No one, no one is maintaining that the Treasury uh, uh, estimates are uh, inaccurate, uh, that they have uh, broadly come in line with the, uh, with the estimates we made before the introduction of the carbon price, and that the family assistance package is covering, if you like, the costs that, that are being passed on. What was clear from recent reporting is that the major driver of cost increases in electricity is not the carbon price. Is not the carbon price. Well, Senator, that's a question of fact. It's a question of fact. You may be in denial, but it's a question of fact. Order. 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 Senator Birmingham. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. And supplementary question, Mr. President. I thank the minister for his answer. As the minister indicated, given the prime minister and the Labor government have apparently had concerns about rising electricity prices for some length of time. Why has the Prime Minister only chosen to voice these concerns just six weeks after the implementation of her 10 per cent carbon tax on Australia's electricity prices? The Minister. Um, I, I, I gather the, the, the Senator's question seeks to criticise the gov government and the Prime Minister for responding to community concerns. I don't know where he's been. I don't know where he's been. Uh, certainly, he hasn't been in WA, where the court, gov the uh, Barnett government, are getting hammered about the increases in electricity prices. Well, I think I think you'll find I think you'll find the uh, the premier would accept uh, that uh, that assertion, Mr. President. So it is the case. It is the case that we've been aware for some time of the growing community concern. It's why it's why when we introduced a price on carbon, we made sure that there was assistance that more than covered the cost of the increase, because we knew people were finding it tough to, to, to deal with those costs. The Prime Minister is, uh, is, is uh, articulating the concern abroad in the community 
and we know that that's not driven by the carbon price. It's driven by other elements, and addressing those is an important national public policy Time's issue. Time's expired. Time order. Time's expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Further supplementary to the minister. If the Prime Minister and the Labor government are serious about the impact of mounting electricity prices on so many Australian households and businesses, why won't the government do the one thing entirely within its power to reduce electricity prices by an average of 10 per cent? Why won't the government simply axe its carbon tax? Order. 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 The, the minister. The minister. Mr. President, uh, the approach adopted by the opposition is fundamentally dishonest in that it seeks to pretend that the major driver of electricity price increases in this country is driven by the carbon price. They know that is false. They know that is false, Mr. President, and no one else asserts it. Mr. President, they also know. They also know that the family assistance measures introduced by this government have provi provided uh, uh, funding that, that is greater than the costs incurred by the increase in, in electricity prices driven by the carbon price. These are, these are family assistance measures that the coalition seeks to reverse. They seek to reverse the assistance we provided to meet the costs of paying that you never will, Senator, you never will. We know you won't reverse the price on carbon. We know you won't do that. But we are interested in protecting Australian families from excessive cost increases, and that's what we're about. Senator Thistlethwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Lundy. With the London Summer Olympic Games now officially ended, can the minister advise the Senate on Australia's performance at the Games and our athletes' achievements? Order. The Minister for Sport, Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I believe all Australians are incredibly proud about how our athletes performed at the London Summer Olympics over the last two weeks. Our team hit the benchmark that was anticipated of 35 medals, and while there may have been a few more silver than expected, each and every one of those tells a remarkable story. In fact, Mr. President, each and every Olympian's performance tells a remarkable story of both um, hard work, often over a lifetime, and each and every one of those performances is, has earned our respect and our acknowledgement. Somewhere around Australia, those performances will inspire a young Australian to perhaps take up that sport for the first time, perhaps to try a little harder in their chosen endeavour. And so that, that wonderful circle of inspiration by our elite athletes, sustaining a system of high participation rates in sport across the country, continues. The breadth and depth of Australian sporting talent has been there on show for everyone to see. But it's true we can't be complacent. As sports assess their high performance programs, they do so knowing the rest of the world has been pretty busy in improving their own, with more countries on the podium than ever before, and countries, including the host Great Britain, uh, having success that is unprecedented. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the chef de mission, Nick Green, and our flag bearers at the opening ceremony, Lauren Jackson, and at the closing ceremony, Malcolm Page and take this opportunity to congratulate each and every person, Olympians and support, support staff and their family, for such a fine effort in representing Australia so well in London 2012. Senator Thistlethwaite. Thanks, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the role that Australian businesses and experts played in making London the successful Games that it was? Minister. I thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Thistlethwaite for this question because, of course, Australians had a wonderful role to play in the success of the London Games. I'd like to begin by congratulating the L London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games for delivering an exceptional experience. As Australians, we can pr be proud that since Sydney in the year 2000, Australia's expertise in the organisation and delivery of major sporting events has continued to strengthen. 
And in London, there's an impressive list of 46 Australian businesses who played key roles in delivering the Games. While I was in London, I made the effort to meet with as many of these businesses as possible, and with the support of the Australian High Commission and our High Commissioner John Douth, I was fortunate enough to be able to have the opportunity to launch Austrade's Australia Unlimited new app called Track Record, which presents these 46 businesses in a very accessible and useful way. Time's expired. Senator Thistlethwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr President. A second supplementary for the minister. Can the minister inform the Senate on any Australian involvement in the creation of the London Olympic Cauldron, and has the minister yet rowed down the Thames? Yeah. <laughs> oh. you, need, you need to respond to that part. That applies to your portfolio. The, the minister. It's a, um, it's a testament to Aussie innovation that the uh, creator of the magnificent Olympic Flame and Cauldron uh, was thanks to South Australian company FCT Flames, run by Con Manius. I also met uh, Mr Manius whilst at the Austrade function I mentioned. Um, for those of you that, that didn't see it—I don't know how you would have missed it—the flame was made up of two, 204 smaller flames, each representing a nation taking part and was totally different to any other cauldron that we've ever seen at the Olympic Games. It was a challenging structure to create and widely acknowledged as being both elegant and beautiful, as well as symbolically meaningful of the coming together of the two, 204 countries that participated. There were several others, of course. Um, I met with Howard Croker from Croker Oars and Martin Schlegel from Advanced Polymer Technologies that made the blue hockey turf. I'm yet to row the course at Eton Dorney, and I'll be doing that when I go back for the Paralympics. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Is the government considering any changes to the operation of the carbon tax that would increase the effective price paid by liable entities from 2015? compared with the prices they would currently expect to be paying after 2015. The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, I assume that the good senator uh, by that question is referencing uh, various newspaper reports uh, uh, rather than— Order. 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 Actually, I think it was the financial Order. review. Ignore <laughs> but I'm happy to say the Ignore Australian the that you want, Mr. Senator, Senator Wong. <laughs> or ignore the interjections. Just continue on the answer, Senator Wong. Uh, I assume from that question that that is because it's a very broad question. Uh, but uh, certainly in relation uh, to the floor price, uh, the government's made clear that we have. Uh, uh, undertaken extensive consultations. We certainly received a number of submissions regarding the operation of the fourth floor price earlier this year. The senator, earlier this, this year, the senator released a discussion paper. Sorry, the government released a discussion paper on possible options for implementing floor price, uh, and no decision has been taken on this issue because we are still consulting with interested parties. Of course, if the senator, of course, if the senator is concerned about higher prices, we know that the highest carbon price. Uh, that uh, could be imposed on the Australian economy is that which would be imposed uh, should Tony Abbott ever be in a position to implement uh, his policies, because we know what that would mean uh, is a $1,300 a year tax on every Australian house. Suki suki la la again, George. Suki suki la la again. You don't order. want Senator, Senator Wong, resume your seat. S -s or, or just you'll get you'll get a chance. This order. Order. <laughs> Senator Brandis. Mr President, on the issue of direct relevance, it was, as the minister said, a broad question, but even the breadth of that question did not extend beyond asking whether the government was considering a particular measure. Where the senator is going now has no bearing on the question of what the government 
is considering. I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister has 52 seconds remaining. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. It was a broad question. I can tell the senator that the government is not considering imposing a $1,300 per year impost on Australian families, unlike his party. I can tell the senator that the government is not 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 considering taking back the tax cuts. Taking back the tax cuts that we have provided, the government is not considering reducing the pensions uh, and the family tax benefits that we have put in place to assist with the carbon price. All of those things, of course, are being not only considered but committed to by the Leader of the Opposition and those opposite. Senator Smith. Mr President, does the government stand by its budget projections that under current rules the carbon price will be trading at $29 in 2015-16 and generate $6.7 billion revenue for the government? The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, the government undertook very extensive modelling uh, which underpinned uh, the budget projections. Uh, and though that modelling was, of course, a very extensive Treasury modelling, which was based on estimates of long-term developments and international carbon markets, as well as the assumption, consistent with government policy, that we would link with markets uh, from 15-16. Uh, so, uh, so, so the, the, the fact is uh, we put out there uh, the government's package, uh, including the very extensive modelling. Uh, and that has formed the basis not only of the budget but of the policy costings. Uh, the government always updates its costings in the usual way, in the usual way, which is something those opposite do not do. Uh, the government updates its costings in the usual way uh, in the budget uh, and in budget updates, uh, and that is the approach the government will be taking. Senator Smith. Thank you again, Mr. President. Isn't it the case that the carbon tax looks increasingly likely to plummet to its floor price when the, price, when the fixed price is removed in 2015, and that the government is currently, currently looking for ways to protect its revenue base from a major collapse. Why won't the government be upfront and honest with the Australian people about the major flaws in its carbon tax model? Order. The minister. Well, Mr President, uh, taking a lecture on being upfront about their policy from those opposite who won't even let me deal with their policy at all in question time, at all in question time is really a little rich. Is really a little rich, Mr. President. Uh, the question, in fact, is a hypothetical. The government has laid out its policy. We provided the Treasury modelling, and we've been clear and upfront uh, about the international linking uh, that uh, we, we are assuming. Uh, in, in the budget and in, and in the policy. Uh, we were upfront about that. Of course, the senator may not know the party that opposes linking, thereby driving up a carbon price, is his party. It is his party, and it's a sort of Barnaby Joyce approach. Order. Senator Joyce Order. approach. Senator Joyce approach. Senator Joyce, to me, that's right. I'll be very respectful. Thank you, Senator Yves. Yeah. Senator Joyce's approach that the Liberal Party are adopting, which is they so don't want to acknowledge there's a global economy, they don't even want to link when it comes to carbon, which will impose a greater cost on Australia. Set order. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment, Senator Conroy. On a refer to environmental impact assessment process. Just, of the just wait, wait a minute, Senator Seward. You, you're entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Seward. Thank you. And I refer to the Browse Basin LNG processing plant, plant planned for James Price Point in the Kimberley, and I ask. Are you aware that Woodside, the proponent for the development, has significantly underestimated the number of whales in the area, given that the Community Science Monitoring Program has so far identified 1,698 whales within eight kilometres of the shore in five weeks, compared to Woodside's assessment of 1,000 whales for the whole of the uh, entire migration season, how are you addressing this gross underestimation in your recent, in your current assessment process? Have you or Order. will you? Order, Senator Seward, just resume your. On my left, Senator Seward is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Seward. How are you addressing this gross underestimation in your assessment process? Have you or will you commission an independent scientific monitoring program to help you assess this project in light of the mounting evidence that the EIA document is insufficient in its assessment process? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, Senator, Evan, uh, Senator Conroy. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Could I thank Senator Seaworth for her questions? Mr. President, we are working with the Western Australian Government on a strategic assessment of this proposal. The state assessment process continues and finalisation of the state report must precede finalisation of the strategic assessment documents. The strategic, strategic assessment process requires all potential environmental, heritage and Indigenous impacts to be fully assessed. I'm aware there are a range of views in relation to this proposal, Mr President. Mr President, the government will not be in a position to make a decision on the plan to develop the precinct until all matters required by the terms of the strategic assessment have been appropriately investigated. The Western Australian Environmental Protection Authority have finalised its draft recommendation report with draft approval conditions and completed a two-week public appeals period. I am advised the Western Australian Office of the Appeals Convener is considering appeals received before providing a report to the Western Australian Environment Minister for final decision. The government will not be in a position to make a decision on this proposal until the Western Australian government has finalised its strategic assessment documents to meet the terms of the strategic assessment agreement. As to whales, in Australian waters they are protected under national environmental law. Humpback whales migrate annually along the Kimberley's Dampier Peninsula coast, including past James Price Point, the site of the Western Australian Government's proposed Browse LNG precinct. Under the terms of reference for the joint federal-state strategic assessment for the Browse LNG precinct, potential impacts to protected matters, such as humpback whales, must be appropriately investigated. The government will not be in a position to make a decision on this proposal until all matters required by the terms of the Time strategic has assessment. Expired. Time's expired. Order, Senator Seaweed. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'm not asking what the decision is. I'm asking how they are going to make the decision and whether they will seek independent, Order. independent scientific advice, as they cannot rely on the Woodside assessment process. So further to that, the Woodside assessment document, environmental assessment process listed dolphins as many dolphins as unidentified and did not distinguish between the normal spinner dolphins and the now identified miniature spinner dolphins. Is the government aware of recent reports time, that— Time has expired. Time has expired for asking the question. Sen Senator Conroy. Uh, Mr President, uh, the government has received an application under sections 9 and 10 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act to protect an area near James Price Point. The Act requires that a report be commissioned in response to the section 10 application. The Department of Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities is currently consulting interested parties on Minister Burke's behalf as part of this section 9 process. As the applications are the subject of a legal decision-making process, it would be inappropriate to comment further. Minister Burke is advised that Woodside has resumed geotechnical investigations, including near shore drilling after a break over the wet season. Minister Burke has received advice from the Department of Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities that these activities are unlikely to have a significant impact upon listed matters. Minister Burke is advised that departmental compliance officers inspected the onshore and nearshore activities on the 6th and 7th of June and that Time's no expired. matters of concern— Time's expired. Senator Seward. It was nice the minister was answering a question I didn't even ask, so I'll try again. How is the government going to undertake to make their decision? And is the government aware that the Woodside have told marine researchers not to tell anybody about the fact that they had photographed the miniature spinner, spinner dolphin and what action will the minister take to address this particular issue around the miniature spinner dolphins? The minister. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr President. And could I thank uh, Senator Seaworth for her additional question? Uh, I'm happy to seek further information for Minister, Bur Minister Burke on that specific issue, and I'll take uh, that on notice for you. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. I refer the Minister to the National Food Plan Green Paper, released on 17 July. Given the importance of ensuring that Australians have access to a secure and safe food supply, why do 18 out of the total of just 22 policy options recommend the establishment of further reviews, committees, forums, evaluations or strategies? Why doesn't the government have a policy to increase the productivity of Australians' food supply? Is the government simply out of ideas about how to support Australian farmers? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Williams for that, Dorothy. Uh, can I say the Australian government uh, is actively working to deliver the nation's first ever national food plan, a commitment we made at the last election. Australia's first national food plan is, is an opportunity to get the right policies in place for a strong, resilient and collaborative food industry that responds to our needs now and into the future. Uh, so Senator Williams is correct to identify that the Green Paper, which is about bringing forward those ideas, bringing forward uh, the issues, uh, is the right vehicle to do that. So I congratulate him in identifying uh, that process. A growing world populations and increasing numbers of middle-class consumers in Asia means that there are significant opportunities for the Australian food industry in the future. The National Food Plan will ensure that the government's policy settings are right for Australia over the short term, medium term and long term. Uh, so what the government has uh, announced over the break was the consultation vehicle, the Green Paper, which will lead to a White Paper which will provide the policy uh, settings which will support, uh, support industry. So on the 17th of July, I released the National Food Plan Green Paper, which outlines how current policies address food issues, as well as discuss any potential changes the government might consider to policies, programs and governance arrangements. Uh, the Green Paper includes a range of policy options, and I would ensure and hope that the National Party uh, will in fact provide some input uh, into the Green Paper on some of those options. These options include issues that cover food security, whether the government should regularly report on our food security and supply chains, issues Mr. President, around market access, how we can assist Australian producers Time's to enter expired, overseas Senator markets. Ludwig. Senator Williams. Mr. President, I have a supplementary question. If the government is to be believed on its promise to increase Australia's food producing capacity, why won't it give consideration to the construction of dams that, have ca that can help increase the, the security of farmers' water supplies? Why does the National Food Plan mention the word dams precisely once and only in regards to aquaculture? The Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Williams for his, uh, for his uh, question. Uh, can I say that the policy options included within the Green Paper, as I was saying, include uh, supply chain relationship, research and development, how we boost Australia's agricultural productivity through rural R&D investment, and, and can I say it also includes, uh, Senator Williams may not have got to this within the Green Paper, infrastructure. Uh, what infrastructure our growing industry uh, needs uh, to ensure that we have a sustainable industry into the future. So rather than settle on one specific policy outcome, as the National Party seem to be stuck on, uh, what we do need is a coordinated infrastructure policy that deals with not only issues around uh, water, land use uh, and rail and transport, freight, all of those uh, together and the policy options about how we uh, can pursue those, including issues around land use, the way we can ensure Australia's land Time is used has sustainably. Expired. Uh, Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr President. I have a further supplementary. Can the minister explain why the National Food Plan does not mention the live export industry, given that it is worth $1 billion to Australia's economy and given in the industry's difficulties in handling new tariffs and regulations that are being imposed by the Indonesian government? Is the government simply trying to hide from its gross mismanagement of this sector? The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Williams for his second supplementary question. Again, the policy options which are outlined in the Green Paper do include issues around supply chain relationships, 
How do we foster stronger relationships for the benefit of uh, suppliers, supermarkets and consumers? And how we ensure that the product gets to market? How we ensure that we've got market access? How we can assist uh, producers order, to enter, or, order, to enter Senator overseas? Ludwig, Senator Ludwig, order. Uh, order Senator, Senator Williams. In relation to direct relevance, Mr President, the question, the second supplementary, is directly in relation to live exports. Why weren't live exports mentioned in the, in the plan? Order. There's no point of order. I'm listening, I'm listening to the minister's answer carefully. The minister has 36 seconds remaining to answer the question. The minister. Minister. Uh, thank you. And of course, extensive stakeholder consultation is, is underway on the Green Paper. Uh, so one would expect that under the headings of those policy options, which included market access, issues around supply chain relationships, those who want to provide comment about how we can improve and, and, and foster relations with overseas countries is also available to be included within the consultation uh, for the uh, Green Paper. Uh, and of course, uh, it also touches on foreign investment as well, and, and I'm sure Senator Williams has a lot to say about foreign investment, uh, unlike his, his uh, Order, colleagues from the time Liberal has Party. Expired. Senator Cameron. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister advise the Senate on recent developments with the National Broadband Network? Order. 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 Senator Cameron is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Cameron. Yes. Is the NBN on track to deliver its commitments in its rollout plans? The Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I've got to thank the Senator for his question and ongoing interest in the NBN. Mr. President, last week I released NBN Co's 2012-15 corporate plan. And Mr. President, important progress has been made by the government and NBN since the publication of the 2010 corporate plan. Since then, legislation has been passed, contracts have been signed, firm agreements have been put in place. And there is greater Order. regulatory certainty, Mr. President. With this greater certainty, the capital cost of the NBN is $37.4 billion, a modest increase of 3.9 per cent. And, Mr. President, the plan released last Order. week. Mr. Order. President, the. Order. 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 The Minister. Mr President, the plan released last week therefore is NBN Co's first operational plan. NBN Co's first operational plan confirmed that the NBN is a sound investment that will pay its own way and generate, Mr President, a 7.1 per cent return to the taxpayer. Mr President, in February. Mr. Uh, I remind those on my left, shouting across the chamber is disorderly. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence. The minister. Economics 101, natural monopoly. Look it up, George. Mr. President, in February, the member for Wentworth said he would hold the government to account on its promise of construction being underway or completed for 758,000 premises by the end of this year. Well, Mr President, the corporate plan confirms the government is on track to meet this target that Mr Turnbull is going to hold us to. Fibre will have been commenced or completed in 758,000 premises by the end of 2012. Senator the Conroy, just, just resume your seat. Now, order. The minister, continue. Mr. President, the plan demonstrates the government is delivering on its commitment. Its rollout is on target. The prices are coming Time down, has and you get a return expired. for the tax. 
Senator Cameron. Uh, <coughs> thank you, um, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister advise the Senate if he has any evidence that there is demand for the NBN? Can the minister also advise if there is any evidence of demand for the speeds uh, being provided by the Order. NBN? Order. Order. Senator Cameron. And can the minister comment, if, if he likes, on uh, Senator Stevens having the NBN satellite uh, uh, installed tomorrow with a saving of $69 Time has per expired. Month. Time's expired. Order. Order. Time has expired. Order. Just, just, just Senator. Se Senator Conroy. Senator Conroy, just resume your seat. The Minister. President, the demand for the NBN is strong. In just a year, take up in Kayama has been 38% and 35% in Wollonga. The member for Wentworth's commitment in his speech last year at the press club was to provide access for 24 megabits. And in May this year, he said 25 megabits was more than adequate for residential consumers. But just this week, Mr. President, the Victorian Minister for Technology released a report from Deloitte Access Economics that finds, surprisingly, that a strong demand for high-speed broadband, particularly, Mr. President, for speeds above 50 megabits. So the report found existing demand for 350,000 services at speeds above 50 megabits. But Mr Turnbull says no, you can't have that, you can only have 25 megabits. Mr Turnbull should meet the Victorian Minister and they should have Time's a chat. Time has expired. Senator Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister outline to the Senate any evidence he has that the NBN is a sound investment for our future? Can the minister advise what the NBN means for the future of education, health service delivery and business productivity in Australia? The minister. Mr President, the NBN, as I've already said, pays its own way. It generates a return of 7.1 per cent. But, Mr President, the benefits of the NBN are not just in its financial return to the government, but in its return to business and the broader community. Over the last few months, Mr. President, I have visited small businesses in Brunswick who are changing the way the Department of Agriculture in Queensland delivers training courses for graziers. I have seen demonstrations of specialist health consultations to remote locations. I have participated in multi-party high-definition video conferencing. And, Mr. President, the Gillard government recognises that the NBN is an investment in our future. What Mr Abbott and Mr Turnbull plan to do is sabotage our children's education and decrease patient care in this country. And that's what those opposite are backing. That's what they are supporting. A second rate Time network has expired. Built to Time's expired. Order. 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 Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order, Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, uh, consistent with what was discussed uh, during question time, I seek leave uh, to table uh, a letter from the Prime Minister uh, to uh, then Senator Bob Brown in relation to the mining tax. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. <laughs> Are there any notices to take? Any motions to take note of answers? Senator Cash. Deputy President, and I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Evans to questions asked by Senator Abetz. Mr Deputy President, as Senator Abetz stated in his question to Senator Evans today during question time, on 17 November 2008, the then Minister for Immigration, Senator Chris Evans, 
said in an address to the Refugee Council of Australia at the Parramatta Town Hall. Labor committed to abolishing the Pacific solution, and this was one of the th first things the Rudd Labor government did on taking office. He then rather arrogantly stated, both in this speech and he confirmed those words today, it was also one of my greatest pleasures in politics. Neither humane nor fair, the Pacific solution was also ineffective and wasteful. Mr Deputy President, jump forward to today, the 14th of August 2012, and what do we, the Coalition, and the public of Australia now have? After years of telling the Coalition, after years of telling the people of Australia that Nauru and the Pacific solution will not work, after years of telling the Coalition and the people of Australia that Nauru and the Pacific solution was neither humane nor fair, and that the Pacific solution was also ineffective and wasteful. Yesterday, former Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston, the man handpicked by the Gillard government to advise them on border protection because the Labor government had totally abrogated their responsibilities in this regard, he has said that the Pacific solution will work and has, in fact, advocated a return to it. For years now, the Labor Party has been telling the coalition and it has been telling the people of Australia that you can't turn the boats back. And again, what did we have yesterday in the report that was handed down by Mr Houston? He has again said that there certainly are circumstances in which you can turn the boats back. For four years, Australia's borders have been weak. Lives have been lost at sea. Australia's reputation with its nearest neighbours has been completely, totally and utterly tarnished. Costs have blown out and people smuggling as a business has been allowed to flourish, all because those opposite, the Labor government and the Prime Minister of Australia, were too stubborn to admit that they got it wrong in August 2008 when they made the deliberate and willful decision to roll back the proven border protection policies of the Howard government. The last four years have seen what has been described as the greatest policy failure by any government in Australia since our inception. The Labor government inherited a solution. They were given one of the greatest gifts a government can ever be given when they take power, and that is we had border protection policy in this country under control. But that wasn't good enough for those on the other side. And they set about deliberately and willfully to dismantle the proven border protection policies of the Howard government. And in fact, Mr Acting Deputy President, on the 6th of May this year, on that one day alone, more boats and more people arrived in Australia unlawfully than in the last five years of the Howard government. And if you want further proof that the decision by the Labor government to dismantle the Pacific solution has resulted in disastrous consequences for this country, <laughs> you need look no further than this statistic. Under Prime Minister Gillard, under her watch alone, the number of people who have arrived in this country unlawfully have exceeded those that arrived during the entire 11 years of the Howard government. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Labor government should apologise to the people of Australia for their abject failure when it comes to border protection. They should apologise for dismantling the Howard government's proven border protection policies, which they have now been told worked and stopped the boats and broke the people smugglers model. They should apologise to the taxpayer for unnecessarily wasting billions of dollars to the tune now of in excess of $4.7 billion. And they should apologise to the Australian people for offering a business model to the people smugglers who by their criminal actions have caused untold suffering to those who lost Order. their lives at Senator sea. Cash, your time has expired. Senator Thistlethwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I, I just cannot believe that we are continuing to bicker over this issue 
before the Senate. Uh, Australians have had enough of this. They have had a gutful of this issue, and they simply want us to get order, on with it. My left order. Over the last five weeks, the order. Houston Committee has been working on this issue. Yesterday, they delivered their report to the Prime Minister, the Australian Parliament and the people of Australia. There are a set of recommendations in that which, uh, uh, Ms., uh, which uh, the committee makes clear are a package. A package. They don't want this parliament cherry-picking some elements of the package and rejecting others. They want it adopted as a package because they see it as the only way that we can get a credible solution to this important issue and to stop people drowning on the open seas. So, we have, we have the, the, the Labor Order. Party, the government, has indicated it is willing to compromise. Yes, we are willing to compromise. We are willing to accept Nauru. We are willing to accept Manus Island. We are willing to accept a compromise to get a resolution to this issue. That's what we're willing to do, unlike those opposite and the Greens, who were not willing to compromise in the Senate six weeks ago Order on when my left. a solution was Order. reached by the House of Representatives. And what are Order. the Houston Committee's recommendations? Well, they recommend increasing the humanitarian intake from 13,500 to 20,000 and eventually, over time, to 27,000. The government has agreed to look at this and will implement this. They have highlighted bilateral cooperation as an important element of this package, something that the government has been working on with our regional neighbours, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia. They point out that the Malaysia negotiations are an important package, part of this package. And they say, and I quote, and this is, this is uh, uh, former Air Marshal uh, Angus Houston uh, and the committee saying, the panel recommends that Australia continue to develop its vitally important cooperation with Malaysia on asylum issues, including the management of a substantial number of refugees taken annually from Malaysia. They recommend that the government continue to work on the Malaysia plan. They also do recommend the reopening of, of, of Manus Island and Nauru. Government's giving that a tick. We're going to move to reopen Manus and Nauru. But importantly, what they do say also, Mr uh, Deputy President, is that temporary protection visas will not work. An important element of the opposition's program will not work. They also say that towbacks, under the current circumstances, will not work. And they make the point that, and they made it clear, that turnbacks cannot be done without the agreement of Indonesia. And we've, we've discussed this on numerous occasions in this place. And it's been evidenced before Senate estimates from Admiral Chris Barry and others who have said that it endangers the life of Australian Defence Force personnel. It endangers the lives and the welfare of those in the Australian Navy who have to undertake this dangerous towback policy. So that, is that the policy that you are advocating? Is that what you are advocating, despite the advice of the leader of the Australian Navy saying that it would endanger personnel? And the other issue is that people just disable the boats. They, they, they deliberately disable the boats to make sure that you can't realistically turn them around. Now, look, this, uh, Mr Deputy President, let's get on to, to, the, to the facts about this. The Australian public want the parliament to move on. Labor's accepted the recommendations of the Houston Committee. We're going to implement them. We hope that we get the support of the opposition in doing that. But what this is really about, Mr Deputy President, is the fact that we have actually got a solution to this. We've got a solution to this important issue. And those opposite can't bring themselves to agree to the fact that we've got a solution on this. So let's look at the major issues affecting Australia. The economy in Australia, triple A rated, triple A rated. You can't get any better. Tick for the government. The minerals resource rent tax, well, that's been up and running and it's being implemented, ensuring that we're spreading the benefits of the mining boom. Tick. The carbon pricing legislation, that's gone through, that's up and running. The sky hasn't fallen in, it hasn't been disastrous, is what people have said. Tick. And now we have a solution on the verge of being reached in respect of asylum seekers. Tick. Now the focus shifts to you. 
You've got to explain to the Australian public your $70 billion black hole in your election costings. The focus will now Order. shift to you, Senator and that's what this Flake. is about. Your time has expired. Senator Scullion. Um, um, Mr Acting President, uh, it's rare when I'd, I'd rise in this place and to start my remarks by offering some advice to the other side. There are some times in life where you realise you've just simply got it completely wrong, and look, we've all been through that. It's a little humiliating. But my advice to you is, and for those future speakers, is to simply do it with some dignity. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it with some dignity. Because, look, there's been a, this is a humiliating, but I have to say, welcome back down. Welcome back down. Uh, and, of course, we need to acknowledge that that has come at some cost. And that's why we need to give it a bit of dignity. This has come at a fiscal cost, a contribution uh, a, 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 of some $4.7 billion. 22,518 people, that's right, the people, that if this policy had been adopted, when the rest of the world knew it should have been, instead of taking some cheap political position, then they would not have been forced to put the lives of those individuals and families at risk. And that they came, of course, in 386 vessels, and sadly those vessels were not in the finest of conditions, and so over 600 lives. And Mr uh, Deputy President, who would know what the real number is? Who would know the real cost? And so we've also got the massive profits and the underpinning of international crime. We're underpinning organisations of international crime that are also involved in other people smuggling, in smuggling and the transport of drugs. We know that international and organised crime is a bad thing, and yet we gave them, this nation, not those on this side, but this nation and those on the others, gave them a reason to operate. Now, we've been asked to believe that somehow this is a different uh, political uh, uh, Pacific solution. Uh, again, those on the other side, Nauru is on the same place on the map. You know, it has the same postcode. Nothing has changed. In fact, we have exactly the same phone number. And I think we've uh, now advised, uh, certainly uh, um, uh, Mr Abbott has uh, asked on no less than 130 occasions has pleaded with the Prime Minister uh, that you pick up the phone. 130 occasions, so it's not as if we haven't known exactly what you need to do. Um, and so we've had some, uh, uh, some uh, commentaries about uh, some of the positions in terms of turning the boats around. If I could just, it is interesting uh, uh, what the Prime Minister actually had to say on turning the boats around, and this was back in 2002, and I quote, and we think turning the boats around that are seaworthy, that can make the return journey and are in international waters, fits in with that. Yeah. Fits in with that. Seemed to be flip-flopping a bit, though, uh, Mr uh, Acting President, which he went on then, uh, a little later in, the, in, uh, uh, well, in, in 2010, very recent history, uh, and then she said, I speak of the claim often made by opposition politicians that they will, and I quote, turn the boats back. Um, this needs to be seen for what it is, a shallow slogan and its nonsense. But then she had a, a bit of an epiphany, uh, because uh, uh, then uh, in 2011 she said, they believe they're coming to Australia, but they end up somewhere else. It's a virtual turnaround of the boats. And sadly, we've seen uh, flip-flopping on, uh, on almost everything, the temporary protection visas back in 2002. We were gonna, uh, and she said, would in the first instance get a short temporary protection visa. Further again in 2002, we want the short first instance temporary protection visa. And of course in 2010, uh, the Rudd government is proud of its reforms in abolishing temporary protection visas and closing the so-called Pacific solution. I'm not surprised why people are confused about their position. Um, we've also had uh, uh, Senator Evans in this place who said in 2008 the Pacific solution was a cynical, costly, ultimately unsuccessfully exercised, introduced on the eve of a federal election in 2001 by a federal government. Well, uh, I'm very surprised they're not standing up those opposite and just simply admitting it's a humiliating but necessary back down uh, and treating this with the dignity that this issue uh, uh, reserves. But I, I would urge all Australians, uh, whilst those on the other side are now acknowledging the mistake that they made, we should think for a moment as we're considering this issue and before we move on. The vanity of four years. 
the cost of the vanity of the four years was 22,518 people, $4.7 billion uh, of taxpayers' dollars that could have been spent on other things, and particularly well over 600 people who very sadly Order. lost their lives. Senator Scullin, your time has expired. Senator Singh. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, Mr Deputy President, today is not a day about pro proclaiming political wins. It is a day when all sides of politics have to stop the um, the blame game, uh, the, the political point scoring, and rise above all of those arguments for order, the basis order. of humanity. Now, Senator Scullion talks about dignity. Senator Scullion, Senator Cash's contribution to this previously is anything but dignified. And in fact, the Hansard will record, the Hansard will record on history that the contribution by Senator Order Cash, on my left. Order. the contribution by Senator Order. Cash that she gave to uh, this uh, matter of taking note will be anything but dignified, and in fact, I would have to say, would have to be one of the most uh, appalling contributions she's probably made to this Senate. It is, and it is because she has chosen to politicise this issue. My left. When we have now heard from an independent panel, an expert panel, that have come out with a report, and of course that the government has in principle accepted, that actually breaks the political deadlock, that actually ends the politics, ends the politics. But instead of that, Senator Cash has to start the politics all Order. over again and cherry pick the parts of the Houston report which suit her best. Now, one thing that the Houston report that the expert panel have made very clear left. is that the, the report should be taken as a package. The recommendations within the report should be taken as a package and should not be cherry-picked. And In fact, if one is to cherry-pick, as Senator Cash has done, and look at Manus Island or look at Nauru or look at PNG, they are very, in fact, a small part of this report, a very small part of a very broad package about how we address the issue of those seeking asylum in this country. Now, one very important part of the package, of which Senator Cash chooses to overlook because it doesn't suit her political point scoring, is the fact Order. that the Houston report Order. looks at increasing our humanitarian intake by 20,000 and eventually in five years by 27,000. Now, that is so significant. That is so significant that it actually makes Australia one of the highest uh, countries of humanitarian intake in the world per head of capita. Order. Now, I am proud to be part of a government who is going to increase the amount of people being able to seek asylum in this country through accepting that recommendation, through increasing our humanitarian intake to 20,000 and then to 27,000. That is Order. what I want to see my government doing, and that is exactly what we will be doing. Order. Because Senator we are Fowler a welcoming country, and we are welcoming refugees to our country, not demonising, not demonising, not denigrating. We are a welcoming country. We had 11 years of, of demonising under the Howard government of asylum seekers in this country and the ongoing politicisation that followed there through. And that is why we are continuing to be in a political deadlock with the opposition that has continued to refuse everything that's been put on the table. We have compromised. We have compromised. We have tried to negotiate and come to an agreement with the opposition. But no, it doesn't, it doesn't suit their political gains. It doesn't suit the political gains that they continue to now make. Now that we've got an expert panel that's come out with that report, they continue to find a way to politicise and demonise in the process, the ultimate process, uh, those seeking asylum Order. in this country. Now that is incredibly regrettable, Mr Deputy President. Incredible, incredibly regrettable that Mr Abbott hasn't been able to resist that temptation, and neither has Senator Cash here today. And in her contribution, has given a very appalling uh, account of the issue of asylum seekers in this country, people in need, and people that need very much our government's support 
our parliament's support and the, to end that deadlock that has been at the heart of this issue, the issue that, of course, people in this place spoke very passionately and emotionally about at the end of our June sittings that's brought us back now to this time. It has, particularly in the last week of parliament, Order, uh, Senator been a, a Singh, very your uh, time has issue expired. that we've needed to address. Order, Senator Singh, your time has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Evans to questions asked by Senator Abetz. Mr. Deputy President, Labor has grown deaf and blind to the frustrations of Australians regarding our borders. Yesterday was a day that Australians have grown tired and weary waiting for. During their wait, their cynicism of the national government and the political process that underpins it has, has been magnified and grown heavy. Across the country, Australians are tired of the politics that has, been the broken, that has broken the protection of our borders, shamed our reputation amongst our neighbours and risked the lives of many. Much is open slather in the sport that is Australian politics, but this episode is gross ineptitude by a Labor government at its best, or it is the most shameful exercise of political survival. The embarrassment and shame of senators office opposite is well justified. The government's reluctance to properly and comprehensively address our border protection priorities has come at great cost. 22,518 arrivals in 386 boats since November 2007, a hefty cost to our border protection. In five years, more people have arrived than in the entire period of the Howard government. In the hop, skip and a jump that is Labor's attempt to restore the integrity of our borders and the Houston report, and more particularly the government's decision to embrace Nauru, Nauru as part of a solution, is a welcome but long-awaited first step. Labor's conversion to a more robust and effective position of border protection is taking too long. It is important and worthy to acknowledge the importance of this long-awaited recognition that offshore processing at Manus Island and Nauru will have a positive effect on reducing the incentives of vulnerable people to take risks. The government's failure to quickly endorse a comprehensive plan is staggering. That plan should be simple. It's been tried and tested and it's passed with flying colours. That plan is offshore processing at Manus and Nauru, it is the resurrection of temporary protection visas and it is a will to turn back boats when it's safe to do so. While the community has lost faith, faith in Labor and its leaders, a group of three has successfully fulfilled the role of policy making for an ineptitude Labor government. The Houston report gives Australians a roadmap for restoring their borders, rebuilding the pride of their country in the region and stopping vulnerable people from undertaking a risky path to a better life. We have a report, we have a roadmap, but we are still left with a government with a poor record of implementation. The question that Australians should now ask is can Labor be trusted to embrace a policy that they have been reluctant to embrace in the beginning. The, the emphasis is important, <coughs> reluctant to embrace in the beginning. In 2003, the Prime Minister was against offshore processing and the Pacific Solution in opposition. She said that Labor would end the so-called Pacific Solution, the processing and detaining of asylum seekers on Pacific Islands, because it was costly, unsustainable and wrong as a matter, matter of principle. In 2000, and, uh, as Deputy Prime Minister, her government dismantled the coalition's successful Pacific Solution policy. Her colleagues said that Labor was committed to abolishing the Pacific Solution, and this was one of the first things the Rudd Labor government did on taking office. It was also one of my greatest pleasures in politics, said Labor's Senate leader. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think it's I believe that it's powerful reading to sometimes take note of the comments in our media, and today's Australian newspaper is an important and powerful one. Sometimes it's easy to dismiss the powerful observations that are often made by our media commentators, but two comments today stand out to me. 
The first, and I quote, says that the dismantling of the Howard government's border protection policies and their re replacement with onshore processing has been a powerful pull factor behind the sharp increase in asylum seeker arrivals by boats in recent years. The Houston panel recognises that in order to stem the tide of asylum seekers, this pull factor must be urgently addressed by implementing policies, including offshore processing, that deter people from undertaking dangerous boat journeys to Australia to seek asylum. And the second quote, and I'll finish on this point, is that the Labor Party's decade-long vacillation on, on asylum seeker policy has been defined by backflips policy reversals and an irrational opposition to past coalition policies that demonstrably Order, worked. Senator Smith, your time has expired. Senator Seward, on the same matter? I'll put the question. Uh, the motion moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of Senator Cor Conroy's answers to my questions on the Woodside's uh, proposed development at James Price Point, and note that the government obviously has not thought about how it is going to carry out, how it's going to undertake its decision-making process on James Price Point. I wasn't asking the minister about what the decision was. Clearly, clearly, they are yet to make that. What I want to know, and what the community wants to know, is how they are going to make that decision. It is very clear that the Woodside Envi Environmental Impact Assessment document is, is unsatisfactory. It is not a comprehensive assessment of the potential impacts of this development on James Price Point. And let us take the whales uh, as an example. I was up there myself last week and have a fairly good understanding now of the whale population in the area and also of Woodside's very gross underestimation of the number of whales for a start that are used in the area. And if they had so grossly underestimated the number of whales using that area and that the fact that this area is a whale nursery and is in fact the home of the whales, not the Antarctic, the whales are born in, at this, in this area. They are conceived in this area. They go down to feed in Antarctic and come back up to give birth in this area. Woodside says there's around a hundred uh, around a thousand use that area within the eight kilometer zone in the whole of the migration season. Well, the community monitors in, a, monitors in a very scientific manner have already, in the first five weeks of the migration period, identified 1,698 whales, including at least 99 mother and calves, with some other sightings that are yet to be confirmed. In other words, this area is a very important area. I asked about the spinner dolphins also, the miniature spinner, spinner, spinner dolphin which Woodside spending $80 million on environmental assessment process, oh, so it must be okay because we've spent lots of money, managed to grossly underestimate the number of whales for a start. Community monitoring program have already highlighted that, for, uh, highlighted the fact that they've grossly underestimated it. Spinner dolphins, the miniature spinner dolphin, they didn't manage to find. They spent $80 million, but they didn't manage to find. Oh, and also they didn't manage to find the turtle nesting sites. If they'd asked the local community, they could have told them where they are and the fact that they do use this area for nesting. But according to Woodside, they don't. And not to mention the bilbies that they never seem to manage to find. That's just a start of the failures of the environmental impact assessment process undertaken by Woodside. And in answer to my question, the government could not answer my question. They couldn't tell us how they're going to be making the decision. They couldn't tell us whether they are going to carry out some independent monitoring. However, the minister did manage to answer a question I didn't ask. I've got to say I'm quite grateful because the community does want to know what's been happening with its Section 9 application. And you know, you can't rush these things. I think they put it in at least 12 months ago. You can't rush these things. So I will take that answer back to the community and let them know that the minister is still undertaking um, that assessment. Last week, in, uh, for the James Price Point uh, development, the, an assessment of it, the Australian Institute carried out an assessment of, in fact, a lot of the state government's own uh, documentation and pointed out that the project will be a net cost to the taxpayers of WA and they will spend more money supporting this project than they will in collecting taxes. 
that in fact it may lead to the loss in other places in WA of them losing their jobs as a, as a result of the impact of this particular um, development. One wonders then, of course, why the WA government is so strongly focusing on James Price Point when this particular site is an economic. Could it be that they have other plans for the site? Of course they deny this, but it is highly likely. 97 per cent of the workers there will be fly in, fly out. So much to the myth that this is going to generate so much local employment. It will reduce the Kimberley's reputation as a world-class tourism destination, leading to a reduction in employment in the area's other largest employment sector. It will increase demand on community services, such as health and police, and cause inflation in the Broome region for housing and things like that, similarly it has in other places in Western Australia. This is a bad development. It shouldn't go on country at James Price Point. The government should look at other places for that development, and the federal government needs to outline how they intend undertaking their assessment process. Thank you, Senator Seward. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk, petitions.